Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Sutton, and I'm the uh, principal investigator, for, as they say, for this, uh, this network. My uh, job this morning is to introduce to you the whole uh, scale and scope of the network, uh, to remind those people who've been fortunate enough to participate in most or all of the prior workshops of what we've been talking about, and also, importantly, to introduce uh, new participants who are very welcome here at this particular workshop to the background and the context in which we're setting this fourth workshop in a series of five. So to begin, we should stress and, uh, and say thanks that uh, the Leverhulme Trust has provided a funding stream which they call the International Networks Funding Stream, which uh, simply funds groups of people in almost any um, academic discipline and context to come together to network and to share experience and best practice on a global scale. And in 2010, 2011, a group of uh, people in the University of Reading came together and believed that we could have um, a setting which would appeal to the Leverhulme Trust in working together on the field of literary archives under the rubric for which we coined the word diasporic to emphasize the way that literary archives, probably more than any other type of archive, certainly more than uh, local, municipal, administrative, legal, or business archives, literary archives tend to move around from place to place, to occur in unpredictable locations, to be divided between locations, and therefore to merit the term diasporic which we were applying to them. So the first thing that we had to do in order to make this network uh, appealing to the Leverhulme Trust was to bring together a group that we thought would be representative and interesting and varied and bringing together different types of expertise, different types of experience. This is the group, as Helena mentioned in her introduction, that we brought together, showing representatives from ourselves in the UK, representatives from Europe with the major collecting centers in France and Italy. We were delighted that the uh, Beinecke Library uh, agreed to represent the, uh, the North American interest and aspect of collection. And then really enriching the network, our representatives from Trinidad and Namibia bringing completely different perspectives so that we could present to the Leverhulme a proposal for a truly global network to, talk, to work together on uh, aspects of literary manuscripts and literary archives. And when, when the Leverhulme Trust agreed to fund this project, although we were absolutely delighted and jumping about and, and so on in Reading, we weren't totally surprised because the network felt like such a, a good and coherent network that we didn't believe that the Leverhulme would very frequently be encountering such a diversity of uh, people proposing to work together. But more than that, oh, more than that, we uh, undertook to bring into close working with the, uh, the network of the six core partners a whole range of other people with an interest in the world of literary manuscripts and archives. And as you can see, we, uh, we made early contact with UNESCO and the International Council uh, on Archives and brought them into our deliberations uh, from an early stage. And right from the first workshop, we were able to think in terms of authors, uh, of literary agents, of people who deal in manuscripts, as well as publishers, uh, societies like the Society of Authors, um, not just the, uh, the authors who create literary manuscripts, but biographers and critics who use them and write about them and so on, so that we felt that we had uh, a good strong core of participants for our network, but also uh, in satellite format uh, around that, uh, a whole range of cross-disciplinary uh, interested parties who would uh, enrich our deliberations over the five workshops which we were asking the Leverhulme Trust to fund. Now, in the middle of this, I'm not going to do this, but in the middle of this slide, there's a hand which would take me away to YouTube where you would uh, witness an incredibly embarrassing, for me, slide on YouTube where I'm introducing the first workshop held in Reading. And 
one of the, thing, the few things that I like about that particular YouTube presentation is that I'm, I'm starting off by saying, and because the Leverhulme Trust is funding us to network, what this means is that the coffee breaks are almost as important as the presentations because it's at the time that we all get the opportunity to get together and network together that we really fulfill the uh, undertaking that we've made and the agreement that we've made with the Leverhulme Trust. And then it cuts away beautifully to the first coffee break in the first uh, network workshop where people from all sorts of different backgrounds are all getting their heads together, talking about their different experiences and so on. So if you do uh, wish to go to YouTube and see that slide, skip the first 15 seconds where I'm doing the introduction and go straight to the networking and it's, it's really wonderful to see that network beginning to fulfill its obligation in bringing together people from all sorts of different traditions of manuscript collecting to share their experiences and to share both best practice and also worst challenges. Oh, gosh, this is very, very responsive, this. Having said that, having said that um, our principal purpose uh, and the reason why we're funded is to network. We, I was fortunate last month to go to a meeting where the uh, director of the Leverhulme Trust himself was reporting back on the various uh, projects that they'd been funding. And he was very, he singled out this particular network uh, for praise and he, he said, and this is because you don't only network, you actually set yourselves objectives, you go out and do things, you try to make interventions in particular cultural settings and to make the network be certainly a networking alliance and coalition, but also much more than that, uh, a group which sets itself objectives and tries to actually go out and do things. I'm going in a little while just to tell you some of the things that we've set ourselves to do. But first, just to look at Just to look at some of the things that we uh, discussed at that first workshop in 2012. Um, so we considered the interaction between the work that we were trying to do and UNESCO's, uh, well, the ICA's uh, Universal Declaration on Archives, which has now been adopted by UNESCO, and we set it in that um, international context. And then we had some discussion which we're going to fill out tomorrow, in fact, but in that first workshop, we started to look at some of the aspects of building collecting strategies which informed this world uh, of literary manuscripts. And we looked at the fact that you can't actually build a collection unless you uh, encounter some form of availability. So the way that manuscripts come to market, the way that uh, authors become aware of the fact that they've got a commodity which will be of interest to uh, a wide scholarly uh, circle and so on. Air, all, all the aspects of what brings manuscripts to market, what, what creates availability uh, in the world of ma uh, manuscripts we discussed. We had some very interesting discussions about uh, value and valuation, how collections of literary manuscripts establish their value. And I think many of us were most struck in that first workshop by the presentation that we received on the valuation of born digital archives and the fact that we're um, just at a, a cutting edge now where we're just starting to work out how this is going to function. And in particular, um, Joan Wintercorn from Quaritch shared with us some, very frankly, some experiences of valuing and disposing of uh, digital archives and the differences that she was encountering between those and traditional uh, paper-based archives. And two key themes that came across, firstly, with digital archives that we don't yet know what sort of usership there is out there, which makes it extremely difficult to attribute a value to um, things which libraries are obviously going to be extremely reluctant to pay five and six figure sums for collections, no matter how important, if they're likely to end up with single figures of users. And there isn't yet an established usership um, of digital archives around repositories, the way that they're being acquired is much more as sort of test cases in most countries which are acquiring born digital archives rather than systematically forming part of a standard collection with a standard set of users. And the second point uh, which emerged in, conne in connection with born digital archives as a serious distinction between them and traditional literary archives is the fact that there's no private market in born digital archives. So if a 
a single letter from a famous poet appears for market, you know that as an institution you're likely to be in competition with uh, private autograph collectors. There's no such market in Born Digital. And as a result, valuation uh, is extremely difficult, disposal becomes extremely difficult, and we're, at a, we're in a real period of uncertainty in terms of where we're going to go with the acquisition and the study of Born Digital Archives. And I'll return to that uh, as well. Here you see some of the other issues to do uh, with building collection strategies that we discussed at that, uh, at that first meeting. And I was particularly interested in the British Library's hub and spoke uh, approach that they identified for us, where they have hub collections, which are the key collections which more or less uh, identify the, uh, the British Library's nature as a collecting organization. And then the spokes that lead away from those hub collections, where they will collect uh, other authors and other types of collection if they have a, uh, an integral relationship with one of their hub collections. That was an interesting way of expressing what probably quite a few of us do in the way that we build collections. And finally, and much less, much less typically, at that particular meeting, we, we reviewed the prospects for joint acquisitions and we studied in particular uh, a curious example where the Bodleian Library and the Deutsches Literaturarchiv, so one institution in the UK and one in Germany, jointly acquired a set of Kafka papers which neither of them individually could have afforded to buy. And so those Kafka papers belong half in the UK and half in Germany and they seem, seem to sort of travel backwards and forwards. We found that to be an extraordinarily interesting uh, instance of acquisition of literary archives, but probably one which was not going to be a precedent and which was going to remain uh, exceptional. Oh. <laughs> just, I'll, uh, I'll speed up now. Uh, these are some of the uh, issues to do with literary archives which were reviewed in that, uh, that first <coughs> workshop. We reviewed the way that because of their diasporic nature, you need particular types of guides to tell you what is where, and very often the word location register is used for that type of guide. We looked again at, certainly from the scholar's point of view, the desirability of keeping collections intact and in a single place, but the way that that conflicts with the reality of the way that literary archives typically find their destinations. We looked, and we had a presentation from a literary agent, we looked at the role of literary agents in uh, bringing uh, authors' papers to their eventual destination, and that was a, an interesting and often less explored uh, aspect of the way that literary manuscripts find their eventual home. And then we've set ourselves the objective, and this is a thing that we haven't yet completed, but we think it's very important and necessary, of um, drawing up a document which would give uh, advice and guidance to authors who are considering perhaps what, what on earth should I do with this great pile of papers which are in my loft and which factors they should take into account when considering an eventual disposal. We are committed to completing that piece of work uh, by the end of this year and in the course of uh, uh, these two days of discussion we'll be returning to that from time to time. We have begun the work and we have engaged with certain authors about the sorts of things um, that they should consider when disposing of uh, their archives. And some of those deliberations um, will, in, will have informed uh, tomorrow evening's surprise mystery announcement, about which I'm not allowed to say anything else. <laughs> we also... I should say as little as possible as this about this, this aspect because it is on uh, today's uh, agenda. So just to say that we reviewed the general um, nature of business archives and the way that literary manuscripts sit inside business archives and are of enormous value, but the expectations both of the owners and depositors of the archive and of the way that the archive work, uh, works will be very different from the way that one would work as a literary scholar with a purely literary uh, manuscript collection. So there's a very distinctive nature of business archives and particularly publishers' archives, which we have to take into account in our general review uh, of the nature and the challenges which face people who want to think about and work with literary manuscripts. 
As the director of the Levy Hume Trust has fortunately noticed, we are setting ourselves not merely to network, but also to do things. And these are some of the projects which we have already embarked upon or which we're intending to do, and to which we attach great importance. So the first is on the website, we've already begun to create a sort of directory of some of the principal diasporic literary collections. So you can visit our website and you can see examples of papers which have traveled from country to country, cases where an author's papers are divided between countries, and we're going to continue to work on that directory. It will not become a comprehensive international location register because such a project is probably unachievable. But it will, by the time that we close down this project, if we do, it will be a very valuable guide to some of the principal literary collections worldwide which have moved away from where you might expect uh, to find them. Secondly, and very importantly, we have set ourselves to be a project and a network which acts in a spirit of international solidarity, uh, not in any top-down sort of way at all, but in working with partners and colleagues uh, from whom we can learn, but to whom we can give uh, support from time to time, and in particular, the uh, Trinidadian and Namibian members of our network are part of that uh, spirit of solidarity, but also very importantly, uh, as we'll be hearing, we've tried to do some, uh, some work with colleagues in Grenada to bring uh, such support as we can as a network to the particular situation that Grenadian Archives finds itself in. I've mentioned the, um, the information sheet. Very importantly, we see ourselves as uh, part of a network of networks. And um, we want to be in liaison with other people working in this field and possibly ourselves to provide a hub where people can feel that they can naturally get in touch with us to talk about issues to do with literary manuscripts that other uh, groups and sectors are working on. And this includes liaison with UNESCO, it includes liaison with the International Council on Archives. So we see ourselves as active and proactive players in, um, in all the cooperative, collaborative and solidarity projects which may be emerging in the whole field of literary manuscripts. I'm now just to finish this uh, introduction to our network going to uh, run through the, the other four workshops, some of which have already happened, one of which is in progress and one of which is still to come, just so that you get a sense of the setting for this particular workshop. So the second workshop that we uh, engaged in was in Pavia in Italy, and we there learned a lot of things about the particularities of Italian literary manuscripts and also Italian copyright with, a, for me, a very striking notion that obtaining a copyright permission uh, in connection with an Italian um, collection of letters required the permission both of the sender of the letter and of the receiver of the letter, which was something which was completely new to me and made me wonder how on earth Italian scholars get through their, their research and their work. So a number of things like that, very striking aspects of the particularities of uh, Italian scholarship, but also setting them in the overall context of this idea of split collections. And split collections is one of the fundamental themes that we've been uh, working through and exploring in the, in the course of this network. The idea that it's, it's really quite rare to have a single uh, institution which holds basically all of the papers of a particular literary author. And we started from Reading with our familiar example of Samuel Beckett, whose papers are divided between universities in Reading, Austin, Texas, and Dublin, but also found in many other places. And we very quickly, very early, before the, the project even got underway, we were clear that this notion of split collections was fundamental to um, the way that literary manuscripts are to be found and are to be studied. And several of the presentations in the two days here will uh, reflect the nature of and the challenges of split collections and the opportunities for cooperation and collaboration which increasingly uh, arise, especially in cases where there are two principal collections. It obviously makes sense for those two principal collections to collaborate, to exchange ideas, and ideally to exchange copies, and that's something that as a network we wish to try to encourage and facilitate. 
The third workshop was held in the EMEC and returned to some of the aspects of um, business archive, as well as studying, again, the particularities of uh, French archives and French collecting. We had some interesting thoughts there about the fact that uh, France has fewer literary agents and agencies than many other countries in Europe and the impact of that on the way that authors work and react with archival uh, institutions. So some interesting thoughts about the particularities of French manuscripts collecting. And then a general discussion about public and private ownership within, within the world of uh, archives and literary manuscripts in, collect in, in particular, taking us again back to review some of the aspects of uh, business collections and how they get uh, used in the study of, uh, of literature. And then finally, as part of that workshop, we opened up something that we'll be returning to tomorrow, this question of uh, archives at risk, which again, we I won't say too much about that now because we are going to have more detailed discussion about that tomorrow, but the various types of archives worldwide whose very ex continued existence is put under threat by sometimes politics, sometimes climatic conditions, sometimes other factors, and what, in a spirit of solidarity, uh, not um, sort of post-colonial arrogance or anything like that, but tr working very, very hard with um, institutions and owners of such uh, papers to try to find the best solution to protect archives in various parts of the world which, whose very continued existence has come uh, at, at risk. I think this is the final slide for this introductory presentation. It isn't necessary for me to say too much about the first set of um, bullet points because that is the business that we're embarking upon now. But it, I hope sets the whole, this presentation has set for you where this fourth workshop sits in the broader review of uh, literary manuscripts and the Diasporic Literary Manuscripts Project. But just to say that for our fifth and final workshop later this year, we shall be visiting the Beinecke Library at Yale, and we'll be looking to the future in particular in reviewing aspects of the digital, both digitized and born digital uh, archives, and we will not be taking uh, a narrow technical look at aspects of uh, born digital archives. We'll be trying to take the broadest and most global view that we can, and I'm delighted to say that we already have an acceptance from uh, Trudy Peterson for example, the former National Archivist of the United States, who is going to talk to us about the human rights aspects of digitization, which are a fundamental part of the transfer of archives from one country to another when countries have different power statuses. So we are, we're going to look intensively at uh, the Beinecke, at aspects of digitization, and we're going to try to predict the future, inevitably, but we're going to take the, the broadest possible approach that we can to those new and pressing issues for us. And then finally, at the uh, Beinecke workshop, what we will have to do at the very end of our last day there is to determine what we're going to do with the, um, all the material that we've collected, all the uh, contacts that we've established, all the work that we've done, because the Leverhulme Trust has funded us for three years. Now, it's... it's probably not right to speculate in too much detail about what might uh, follow from 2014 for this network, but I hope that by the end of these two days you'll all be inclined to agree that it would be very sad indeed if it suddenly just came to a, a guillotine end at the end of 2014. That is absolutely not our intention. We would like to find ways, if we could, of reconvening the network after a suitable period of time so that we can assess progress and so on. If we're not able to find any way of hosting the network in a continuing and ongoing way, then the International Council on Archives has already indicated that it will absorb all of the materials that we've created, all the information that we've gathered, and all the networks and links that we've created in the course of our three years of work. So it's very important to us that um, we continue beyond uh, 2014. Um, I'm going to conclude at that point and say that I, I'm grateful to you for listening to me to this presentation and I hope that I've helped to set the discussions and deliberations of these two days which are very very important 
to uh, the whole essence of this network to set that in the wider context of what we've been trying to do from to the beginning of 2012 to the end of 2014 in presenting a review of all the issues which face us under the heading of diasporic literary manuscripts. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Alison, who's chairing the next session.